Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You made it this far. Uh, Marty was nice this morning. Normally, he talks about my uh, checkered past, my misbehaved youth, so I can't hold a job. Uh, so you were light on me today, Marty. Thank you. Uh, by the way, we are in Buckhalter's offices, and I have to give them a plug. Having dealt with endless law firms in my past, Buckhalter uh, represents us in some of our art lending activities, and uh, another partner is working with us on a reggae tier two security that we filed with the SEC. We're almost finished with that. Uh, the firm has been a great one to work with, just so you know. Uh, beautiful offices, but uh, great people. And here's a shocker. How many people regularly deal with law firms? <laughs> They're reasonable. Oh. Holy mackerel. <laughs> anyway, I'm not gonna bore you with my past. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Redirect directly germane experiences of mine. Years ago, with two other people, I started the Discover Card. Uh, that relates to Asherex. Uh, second, we have been an art lender against museum quality fine art, apropos of the recent panel. Uh, we take delivery of the collateral. How prosaic. Oh. We file a UCC1 on it. If you don't pay us, we're going to sell the collateral. Hard money lending. And the other third business that I started that I should mention, I started a company called Answer Financial. And this was an insurance exchange. Uh, battered and bruised, many years later, we ultimately became the largest seller of auto and home in the United States. Uh, God bless all states. They own it today. And I had a very fun experience, Marty. My daughter sent me an email yesterday saying she's a first year student at Booth. She said, Dad, you won't believe it. Answer financial is in the case I've got due tomorrow. <laughs> and it's kind of fun for her old man father. I'm here to talk about our latest venture, my latest venture, called A Share X. We have a preliminary website up to look at. I've been working on it for the last two years. Shockingly, we will go live with it in July. So I'm talking to you this morning. I want you to wear two different hats. Fair enough? First hat. We raised some capital already. We'll raise a little bit more. So I'm talking to you as potential investors in this business. Of all the crip crap I've started, I think this is probably the lowest risk, highest octane business I've started. Second, I'm talking to you as potential fractional buyers of what we're doing. Okay, what is it? HRX is a marketplace for the buying and selling of fractional interest in any hard asset. I can't look at everybody that may be online. How many people here were in Alts LA? Anybody? What? You may have heard Jenny Johnson of Franklin Templeton give a long speech, good one. And she opined that fractionalization is the most important trend in finance today. Uh, we've had the pleasure of talking with them. They find what we're doing pretty interesting and very on point to where they're going. They've made some substantial investments in the space. Here's the distinguishing characteristic about what we're doing. Every transaction will be market-based pricing. I'll come back to that further. Our initial focus is democratizing the ownership of museum quality physical art. It's a pretty good sized market, $1.7 trillion in physical art outstanding, about $68 billion a year in transaction flow. Sizable. Okay, let me give you an example. 
imagine a $10 million Picasso. Maybe it's a collectible Ferrari worth $10 million. We've been asked recently, can you do this with a pool of diamonds? And the answer is yes. This pool of diamonds was sold for $10 million. Think about it. All of these are pretty attractive assets. Yet how many people can buy a $10 million Picasso? And if you buy one, you should really buy a portfolio of high-end art. Now we've really shrunk the market. Let's do something pretty exciting. Let's give people the chance to buy a piece of any of these assets. Why do high and ultra high net worth people buy them? Because they perform better. Let me just pick on art. Better than speculative art. High-end art is compounded at 8.5% for the last 50 years. I love parts of the art world. Why? If the U.S. market is crummy, sell it in Abu Dhabi, sell it in Hong Kong. You, it's transportable. It's like gold. It moves around the world with currency fluctuations. So you've got very attractive assets. How do we do it? And it's very distinctive. Take the $10 million Picasso. We will conduct an auction. Not some money manager saying, Marty, that Picasso is worth $10 million. Trust me. Marty, of course, would say, I'm not sure I do. We're going to give you market-based pricing and allow through a unique auction system that we have a patent pending on. For fractional holders, fractional bidders can bid for 5,000 to whatever they want. They compete among themselves and they compete against 100% bidders. Wow, doesn't exist today. So you get market-based pricing. Now, if the fractional bidders win the auction, we will issue an SEC qualified Reg A tier two security. Not bad. In addition, we will create a secondary market for the trading of those securities. Third and very distinctive. Gotta play it straight. Give the shareholders, not an intermediary, Give the shareholders control over the asset. This is a steely-eyed crowd. Think about it. typically a money matter says, Alan, trust me. I'm going to charge you one and a half percent management fee per year, but I, you're too dumb. I'll tell you when a good time is to sell it. Don't worry about my fees. I said, eh, I don't like that. I said, let's give the power to the fractional shareholders. They determine when to sell the asset. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. Okay. Who are the buyers for any of this stuff? Well, take the art world. It applies to the other stuff. There are 104 museums around the world. Two thirds are in the U.S you know there's intense interest in this stuff. Problem is most people can't afford it. 90% of all auctions are for items worth $50,000 or less. Why? They can't play at a higher level. Let's give them the chance to own a piece of an enduring value asset, a hard asset. We talked the economics, group this morning talked about how depressing it is in inflation. We know hard assets are a good thing to own in an inflationary environment. Okay, four pieces of HRX. First, patent pending auction system. It took us a year. We're building in effect a full on trading system. It works. 
we're testing it about every three or four weeks. We have a major test coming up in May. So everybody can compete fairly with visibility. Second, when I started this, I said, oh, Alan, let's fractionalize the yard, but let's use the blockchain and we'll tokenize the security, rub it all over your body. Very exciting, right? Hip, web 3.0. Here's a practical issue. In the US, the SEC really does not recognize the blockchain as an immutable record. We went down that path and figured out how to do it. However, all it does by doing that, it's sexy, it adds a lot of costs to the investor. No, no, got to be prepared if the SEC really changes the mind. But in the meantime, let's create an SEC compliant ecosystem. That means we had to create a broker dealer for the primary auction, a broker dealer and ATS for the secondary trading, a cash custodian the transfer agent all approved by the SEC and then integrate each of them. A lot of work. So we put that in place. Then we had to create the Reg A tier two security. Here's the interesting thing. More damn lawyers, say, oh, Snyder, it'll never work. You'll never get it through the SEC. Just filed yesterday the response to the last comment from the SEC and we rolled over and said, okay, we'll do what you want. I suspect we'll clear the SEC in the next few weeks. That's a major milestone for us. Then in addition, and I haven't experienced this when I built the insurance exchange. For the last year, we've had one of the five largest auction houses working with us it's called Bonham's. Major top five auction house. And we've been seeking their advice and some of the decisions we had to make. Pretty neat to have that in place. Why? Because they got a huge client base. And they keep browbeating me saying, hurry up, Snyder, get the damn thing built because we want to launch. Okay. Standard question I ask as an investor. Large new cohort of potential buyers we will bring to any sale of these assets. Individuals, obviously, Picasso, millions of followers. All of the major artists have huge number of followers. Be encouraging. Masterworks is out there. Very expensive. Very expensive. How many people know Masterworks? Gosh, they're out there flag in the world. HRX is 240% less expensive than Masterworks. Masterworks is acting as a money manager. We are acting as an exchange and we're giving the power to the investors. Very different. I'll give you a funny war story. I was talking to a friend of mine running a large endowment. Ah, Alan, what have you been doing lately? I told them about HRX. I talked about individuals who said we're going to eventually get to the institutional market. The phone call stopped. I said, Alan, are you just stupid? <laughs> nice heartwarming expression. I said, probably. <laughs> I said, but why do you say that? He said, Alan, think about what you're putting in place. We're never going to buy a damn Picasso. We're not going to buy a $15 million Ferrari, even though it may be a great investment. You have created market-based pricing. Second, you're giving us control of the asset. If we don't like the secondary market, we'll sell the damn asset and get any discount. Think of closed end bond funds. He said, Alan, endowments, pensions, and foundations are a $36 trillion market. 
you will get more money than you're entitled to with even a modest penetration of that marketplace. So we're talking individuals and institutions. <laughs> Bonhams and several other auction houses said, we don't have institutional investors. We will create that market for them and bring that cohort to any auction. There are no money manager duplicative fees or investor misalignments with HRX. <laughs> Bite size between 5,000 and up to whatever you care to spend. Other thing, as a lender against art, cottage finance for us, we got a $100 million book, no big deal. However, the information we get is more extensive than most any buyer gets on a piece of art. We will provide that information to our potential investors. Increased liquidity, I love that. Tax advantages, oh, how about that? The average tax on a collectible profit is 28%. Everybody in this audience will say, yeah, but Alan, if you sell the stock, what's the tax? 20%. Ooh, nice pickup in return. And we can switch if the SEC changes its feelings from block to blockchain and tokenization. All right. When I was an advisor, a special advisor to Goldman Sachs and Kelso years ago, they tattooed on my forehead. I don't know, maybe it's faded. They said, Alan, a business idea is important, but who are the people behind it? Have they played at scale and are they able to respond to changes? I'm really lucky. We have a team at Acerex. We have a CIO that has played at the largest scale and doing large scale development. Great. We have a CMO who's been a product manager for Mattel, Taco Bell, et cetera. So you got a team of people. We have a CFO who ran a six and a half billion dollar series of funds for AQR one smart puppy and some others that I won't bore you with. So you got a talented crew of people, eight years of lending in the art lending space. What's the advantage of partnering with other people? When I started the insurance exchange, there's one person, me, no oh, clients. I watched competitors beat their chest, say, oh, I'm going to build a retail brand. I had run all the marketing for a large securities firm. I said, building a retail brand, holy crap, is that expensive? I said, you can't do that, Alan. You're a chicken. True. We partnered with the world. We partnered with Walmart. We partnered with Primerica. We partnered with every major bank. And Answer Financial was the only survivor of that early crop. With HRX, we will partner with lots of other people. All right. Or you'll get the hook in a minute. If you I... got about uh, five, 10 more minutes. Okay. And I have questions. All right. When I did the insurance thing, I could run a large insurance company. Great. It costs, you all probably know this, it costs more money to put an insurance policy on the books than you get paid in the first year. Damn. We were growing at 80% a year. Holy crap, does it push out your cash flow break even? Brutal, I had to raise too much money for it. The revenue model for HRX warms my black heart because a lot of the revenue is up front. We get a share of the buyer's premium, meaningful, based on the value of the art. If the fractional holders win, we get an additional 4% sourcing fee based on the value of the art, upfront revenue. On the secondary trading, we charge the buyer 2.5%, the seller 2.5%, we pay the broker dealer two, we keep three. On the sale of the artwork, so our interests are aligned, we get 10% of the profit. Not a huge fee. Now, 
versus masterworks, this is a bargain. Versus the typical way of owning art, it's cheaper. Pretty good. Like that. So, <clears throat> something else to consider. As we've gradually in the last month come out of the closet on this venture, to my astonishment and pleasure, we have been approached by three companies who have hardly made any effort at this. Three companies have said to me, Alan, one is a private equity player generating relatively small private equity deals said, Alan, you're way ahead of us. Can we license your execution? Okay, maybe. Another source of revenue. Second, we were approached by a real estate company. As a kid, I built a large real estate syndicator doing a billion dollars principal a year. Big firm, no kudos for me. Real estate company said, hey, can we license it? Lastly, and this is the probably the biggest one, a huge gaming company said, what you're doing is perfect for us. We are an enabler of <clears throat> helping all the major gaming companies sell stuff to their clientele. We think what you're doing applies for us. We'll see where that goes. I think there'll be a lot more opportunities like that for HRX. It's hard to put all this crip crap in place. Something else as an investor that I have focused on. What are the exits? When I built the insurance exchange, I took too much money, stupid. Here, we have stretched each dollar until it squeaks. Learn my lesson. Why? Because I want it to be highly marketable. And you look at the comps out there today, Masterworks raised $100 million in a billion dollar valuation. And I would say this if they were sitting here, I think this model is far superior. Imagine this, and I've talked to them. The NFT platforms, just three or four of them worth over a billion dollars, Open Seas raised a bunch of money at a $13 billion valuation. It's probably less today, but a bunch. If they owned this execution, they would own the art market. Every auction house will have a decision when we come out of the closet, Do I build it or buy it. One of the big auction houses has tried to build something roughly similar. It's failed. When I built the insurance exchange, one fun war story just for Mary. Bank of America came and visited us. They spent all day with us, an army of players. At the end of the day, they said, hey, Alan, this is really great. We love what you're doing. But we're Bank of America. We can build any damn thing you can better, faster. I was a little grumpy. And I said at the end of the day, I said, well, then, God damn it, go do it. <laughs> Two years later, they came back and said, well, we like the deal you offered. We pissed away $20 million. <laughs> I said, yeah, but it's two years later. The deal is different today. And we ultimately did a deal with them. <clears throat> All right, enough. We have questions. Yeah, absolutely. Right, so um, two questions. My two core questions are, what's the IOR to an investor who invests with you today, right? So I think you're raising capital, number one. Yes. And number two, can you go through an excruciating kind of detail the difference between you and Masterworks? Because as you said, Masterworks is a fund and you are an exchange and you are providing services they don't provide. Yeah. And also the way you are value, doing valuation is, is very different from how Masterworks does valuation. And I think valuation matters less to you. Good. Good question. Tough question. <laughs> Here's the deal. Masterworks, God bless them. They were innovators. I give them credit. They are positioned as a money manager. So they go out, buy a piece of art, 
and then tell you, here's, what, here's the price we're selling it to you for. Believe it, not believe it, how comfortable do you feel? We say, no, we're gonna source a piece of art either through Bonhams or all the dealers that we deal with. And we will let the market determine the price. I'm an investor, I like that. Second, we will give you more information than is commonly available in the market. So a more informed purchaser, love that. And maybe the most important one, we give the control of the asset to the shareholders. They determine. We give them the right by a simple majority vote in the sixth year to sell the piece of art. <clears throat> if they decide, yeah, it's six years, it's kind of crummy, let's wait a year. Fine, we give them another vote in the seventh year. In the eighth year, we'll sell it if they haven't decided earlier. Why? We wanted to make it really simple for the investor, Marty. Frank, guy owns shares in this asset. We didn't want a nickel and diamond with storage costs, insurance costs, accounting costs. We eat all of those. Now we have a huge chug policy, so it's pretty efficient to us, better than most any individual would ever get or institution. So that's why we will sell it in the eighth year. And we also say in the offerings. So you are. <laughs> okay, so right. so so I I'm so can you, you oh wait a minute I, I didn't, I didn't makes, no, I'm gonna ask my question you can answer on top of that. Art is one of the least regulated markets in the world. Yes, right, and it's global in nature, right? Can you talk about that regu regulatory environment and why it's important that you're doing what you're doing? Because the reality is there's a gazillion experts out there who can give you a price varying one way or the other. Ultimately, the market is what determines what real pricing is in valuation. Talk, talk about what, how you're creating a construct on top of this highly unregulated environment. Okay. This could be a days of conversation. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Here's the thing. We will bet the art. Authenticity, <clears throat> provenance, exhibition history, permanent export certificate, all of that jazz. That today. In addition to us, take bottoms. They will also do the same examination. Auction houses are really picky about all that stuff, Marty. Mm -hmm. So here you have double research on the art itself. In addition, when we auction it off, we will give a high low estimate of the art based on experts. Who knows, it may trade for even higher, and they frequently do. You ask the question, what's the return? Great, tough question. <clears throat> I get kidded about this. We've built this execution. We raised $3 million in a safe. We will have completed the execution with that 3 million, people can't believe we did it for that price. I learned my lesson from raising $200 million in the insurance exchange. We're raising some additional capital. Why? Because we're dealing in high value stuff, whether it's diamonds, cars, bottoms wants us to play all over the place. We want to put that cash on the balance sheet, Marty is I want to prove to people, I've never been sued by an investor, and I want people to know we're here for the duration. They be screwed, but we're gonna be around. That's why, now what's the return? Let's say in aggregate, we put $8 million in this puppy, total, maybe. But we reach cash flow break even given the upfront revenues very quickly in 2024. 
let's say it's $8 million, might be less. Think about it. You got companies trading out there for bunches and bunches of money higher than that. Should we play out the hand? When I had the insurance exchange, I would have sold it early. Instead, we sold it late. I think a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Personal. Our investors ultimately, Marty, will make that decision. But you look at the valuation, just the cash expended, it ain't a hell of a lot versus the potential value of this opportunity. That's what keeps me going morning, noon, and night, weekends, nights, etc. The life, the life of a lot of an entrepreneur. Does anybody else have any complaints or disagreements with anything I've said? You're silent. All right. Yes. Quick question, Alan. Um, the three million that you raised on the safe. Um, any notable investors? No. Here's how I got them. I talked to friends of mine in the financial business, being old and crotchety, yes, my wife. I said to him, talk me off the ledge. I need to start another company like a damn hole in the head. And these turkeys to a person said, Snyder, if you don't do it, you'll forever regret it. Second, you got to take my money now because when you get serious, you won't. So that's how we got the initial three million. We will invest more ourselves in this next round. By the way, the terms of the safe, I think are pretty compelling. How many people know about safes? Cool. Why Combinator originated? They would say a safe should have either a discount or a valuation cap. One of our investors, a partner in Google Ventures, said, Snyder, you should set the valuation cap at 50 million. I said, that's being a pig. It's too high. We will push it out beyond launch by having some additional investments in this safe. So I said, being old school, I said, I want a discount of 15% and a valuation cap of 25. So if we got lucky and did a, a price round, we may or may not do, at let's say 50, the safe holders would get twice the equity. Maybe the world stops as some of this panel has talked about, and then you get a discount if it's less than 25. So you're protected pretty well on the downside as well. And you have a priority in all the company's assets. One last thing on the patent, and I promise I'll shut up. <laughs> Gibson Dunn referred us to the patent attorneys. This is really encouraging. Patent attorney said to me, Alan, I've looked through all the materials on this patent. I've done three patents on auction systems. I don't know you very well. Don't be offended. You're taking this too casually because you keep telling me the patent applies to Asherex. I think this patent will be worth more than your entire damn company. It from your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> and I it's hard to build this. Anyway, thank you. Great job. Thanks so much.